this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 1 to 6 from the New Living Translation. I want to preach from a few minutes from the subject, what's the difference? What's the difference? And so 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, I'm going to read the text and then we'll pray and we'll get right into the word of God. <clears throat> the text really is about Solomon, but the word that I have from the Lord is about David. And we're going to talk about what's the difference. And so it reads from the New Living Translation, 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Solomon worshiped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. And so if you'll look to the Lord with me for a word of prayer, Father God, we just thank you just for the privilege and the opportunity to even be virtually in your house, to worship you, God, and to hear a word from you. And I pray, Father, in this preaching moment that you would hide me behind the cross so that they won't see me or hear me, but that they would see you, hear you, and respond to you. You are the faithful God that has called me. You said you also would do it. I pray that you would do it now, God, for your glory and for your holy name's sake and for the advancement of your kingdom. You promised me that out of my belly would flow rivers of living water. And I pray, Father, that you would do it, Father God, because you promised you would, not because I'm deserving, not because I'm worthy, but because you are faithful, God. You are faithful even when we are not faithful. And I pray that you would speak a word into our hearts that we can hide in our hearts so that we won't sin against you, so that we will grow to be the men and women of God that you called and ordained for us to be. I pray, Father God, that your word would fall on good ground this morning, that it would produce fruit for you, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And I pray just for a special grace in a fresh anointing to rightly divide, accurately handle, and skillfully preach your word of truth in the name of Jesus. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do, Father. I expect you this morning. I thank you for how you are going to heal, deliver, set free, and encourage. Give direction where direction is needed. Give correction where correction is needed. Whatever we need, God, I pray that your word would pierce the hearts of your people with bullseye accuracy in the name of Jesus. And I thank you in advance for doing it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so 1 Kings chapter 11, again, it's about, the text is about Solomon. It's about the fact that he loved many foreign women, um, and, and it kind of goes into detail. But the title of the word today is, What's the Difference? Because I thought it was so interesting when I was reading, and I just happened to be, you know, reading through this chapter. It may have been a devotional a week or so ago that sent me to this particular chapter, but certain things just jump out, you know, at me when I read a text, even if it's a familiar passage to me. I try not to just, you know, gloss over it. And when I got to verse, it's talking about Solomon, his wives, what God told him to do and not to do. But when it got to verse four, it says the end of verse four is, well, the whole verse four says in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord, his God, as his father, David had been. And so the Bible says that David was completely faithful to God. And even when we get to verse six, it says in this way, again, there's this comparison, right, between Solomon and David. It says in this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. Now, I have no problems. I have no beef with David. He probably is my favorite Bible character. If you make me pick one, I'm probably going to pick David. I love David for a lot of reasons, but what went through my mind is, well, wait a minute. Like, I get that Solomon messed up. I get that he loved many foreign women. I get that God had told him, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts. And he did what God told him not to do. I get all of that. 
But when the Bible says in more than one place that he did not follow the Lord completely like David had done and that he did not, he wasn't completely faithful to the Lord the way David was, I'm like, well, wait a minute now, because David was a murderer now and David was an adulterer now. And so what's the difference? Clearly, it's not because David's whole life, he led this upstanding life that was above reproach. David messed up more than once and David messed up big. I mean, you know, maybe it's just me, but murder is pretty big in my book. You know, adultery is pretty big in my book. And so there is something that made God say it. And even, and if we backtrack to when he first said it or where we see it, even before David was king, David was probably still just a young boy at this time in 1 Samuel chapter 13. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, Samuel is having a conversation with Saul because Saul was king and he was supposed to wait for Samuel to show up to offer the burnt offering. Saul would not wait. He got nervous. He got afraid because the Philistines were coming. And so he offered the burnt offering because he didn't wait for Samuel. But here they have this dialogue. And in 1 Samuel 13, 13, it says, how foolish Samuel exclaimed, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And I thought that was interesting. Again, not to focus on Saul, but Samuel's words were, God sought out a man after his own heart. God was looking for someone. God was looking for someone that he could trust. God was looking for someone who had a heart after him. God said he... The, um, Samuel told Saul, listen, God looked for someone and he found someone. He found David and you're going to lose the kingdom and God's going to give it to David. David was oblivious, right? God, David was not privy to this conversation yet. David didn't know anything that was going on. But when David was out tending his father's sheep and just minding his business, God had his eye on him. And, and God said, I, I, I sought for someone. I was looking for someone. And I found someone and that someone was David. And so my question became, well, what's the difference? Even if he's even referred to in Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching. This is his first missionary journey and he's preaching at Antioch. And in his sermon in Acts 13, 22, it says, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So I feel like there's a little clue that last sentence, he will do everything I want him to do. But what I love about this and I'm reading from the New Living Translation where it says a man about whom God said, but the New King James Version or the NIV Version says a man who God testified about. And it is just amazing to me. It's one thing when someone else writes your bio, but when God writes your bio and God says, I have found someone, a man after my own heart, then I want to know, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between Saul and David? What's the difference between Solomon and David? What made, God, what made David stand out when God was looking for someone, when he was looking for a man after his own heart? What was it about David that God chose him? What was it about David that, that made God say this? Because what I understand is even though when God said it in, in 1 Samuel 13, you know, through Samuel to Saul, David was probably still just a boy at the time. He had he was not king yet. He had not committed adultery yet. He had not murdered yet, but God knew that he would. God knew that he would and he still said, but this guy here, this is my guy. Like this guy here is a man after my own heart. And my desire is to be a woman after God's heart. So my question is, well, how do I do that? And I'm encouraged because clearly it's not living a perfect life. Like sometimes I wonder, I don't know if I could ever be like Enoch, you know, in Genesis chapter five, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God. He walked in close fellowship with God. He walked in so close fellowship with God that he was translated. God just said, well, you may as well walk on to heaven, you know? And in and, and Hebrews chapter 11, 
verse five, it talks about Enoch again. And it says that before he was translated, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And I want to be like Enoch too. I want that to be my testimony too. It's my prayer that my testimony will be that I please God. But with David, I'm a little bit more encouraged because if I messed up a few times in my life, it does not, it does not mean that I still can't be a woman after God's own heart. Because clearly when we look at David, you know, that's not one of the requirements. And I'm not saying it's okay to sin. I'm not saying it's okay to mess up. What I am saying is what's the difference. And I believe that there are some things as we examine David's life that we can see what it was that made him a man after God's own heart. What I believe it was is that his heart was tender toward God. He had a heart that was tender. It was soft. It was pliable toward God. And I'm going to give you a few points and illustrations throughout scripture to show you what I mean when I say that his heart was tender toward God, because you can be saved. See, we are saved by believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth the Lord Jesus. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he is the son of God, if you accept the fact that you are a sinner and you need a savior and you ask Jesus to come into your heart and to save you, you will be saved. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I want to suggest to you this morning, and I might rattle your theology a little bit, but I want to suggest to you this morning that you can be saved and still not have a heart that is tender toward God that, you know, lends itself to God. And let me give you some examples of what I mean. The first thing, and it was actually, um, well, yeah, I'll go, I'll say it was actually my third point, but I'll, I'll say my first point first. My first point is that David had a repentant heart. And so God calls us, the Bible tells us that if you confess your sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We know that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that there is none righteous, no, not one. So we're all in the same boat, right? We're all sinners saved by grace. You're not better than me. I'm not better than you. We're all in the same boat. If you walk around the boat, you'll see all of us. We are in the sinner saved by grace boat. But David had a repentant heart. So if we all sin and we all fall short of God's glorious standard, the psalmist said, how can I even know all the sin lurking in my heart? You know, my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Then the separator becomes, what do you do when God convicts you of sin? What is your heart response to God when you are wrong and God calls you on the carpet? Whether he calls you on the carpet through conviction in your heart, maybe you're reading your Bible, you're having a devotional word and God begins to deal with you about the way you spoke to your spouse or deal with you about the, you know, the thing that lacked integrity that you did at your job, or maybe God will send your pastor or your teacher or someone and kind of give you a word of correction that's a little bit hard to hear. What do you do? do when you are confronted? What do you do when God calls you out on your sin? Do you have a repentant heart? Are you sorry? See, because here's the thing, lamenting is not necessarily repenting. You can cry because you are sorry that you got caught. You can cry because you are sorry that you have to pay the consequences of your sin. It does not mean that you are sorry that you sinned against God. But when David messed up and he messed up big and he messed up royally, but when God called him on the carpet, the thing broke his heart and he was repentant. And what he told God is, I have sinned against the Lord. I am sorry. Let's take a look at in 2 Samuel 12. So I talked in the very beginning about how David was a murderer. Um, he first, he slept with Bathsheba, but he asked about her. He saw her bathing on the rooftop. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. You can read the text for yourself in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It was a time of year where kings were supposed to be at war. That's a word all by itself. If I just stay where I'm supposed to be, then I'll stay out of trouble. Sometimes we end up in trouble because we're not where we're supposed to be. It was the time that kings were supposed to be at war and he was home taking a nap. And so that's that's another word for another time. But so he sees her, she's beautiful, she's bathing. He asks about her. He finds out he's mar she's married and he decides that he does not care. So that's the first problem because sin is a snowball. So that's where the ball started rolling. And so he calls for her, he sleeps with her, he gets her pregnant. He tries to cover up that sin. I know you and I would never try to cover up sin, but David tried to cover up sin. He tried to cover it up by getting her husband. He called her husband Uriah, who by the way, was 
was one of his 30 mighty men. So not only was Uriah, her husband in David's army, but he was a high ranking officer in David's army. He was loyal to David and he was loyal to the kingdom. And David called for Uriah tried to get Uriah to sleep with his wife so that he would think the baby was his. That's why I tell people all the time, you don't need scandal or how to get away with murder and nothing else. Just read your Bible because it's deep. And so she tried to get, you know, David to sleep with um, Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba, but he wouldn't. He said, there's no way I can go home and enjoy my wife and all of that when everybody else is on the battlefield. So plan B. Plan B was, well, now I got to kill him. And he sent him back with a letter that told Joab to send him to the front line in the heat of the battle so he can get killed. And Uriah was so loyal to David as his king that he did not read the letter that was in his hand. He took his own death note back to Joab and he didn't know it because even though David was not loyal to him, he was loyal to David. So God was upset. When I say David did some messed up stuff, David did some messed up stuff. And so finally, 2 Samuel chapter 11, it snowballs because that's what sin does. It snowballed and the chapter ends with the Bible saying that God was not pleased with David. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when the chapter opens up, God sends a word through the prophet to David. He gives him this story that David thinks has nothing to do with him because sometimes when we are very deep in sin, it's hard for us to see it. And it's hard for God to come to us directly and say, you're wrong. So very often God does with us what he did with David. And he presents a situation that if it was somebody else, we could see how wrong it was. But since it's us is very difficult for us to see ourselves. And then, but finally, after all that, and you know, he calls him out, Nathan calls out David, tells him what he did, tells him how unhappy he is. Then in 2 Samuel 12, 13, then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't fight it. He didn't argue it. He didn't say, well, let me explain. He just said, you're right. You're right and I'm wrong. I have sinned against the Lord. And that's so important because there are other times confession does not necessarily, like it's an acknowledgement that I have sinned against the Lord. That is when he penned Psalm 51. You Bible readers may be familiar with Psalm 51. It is the Psalm that deals with the fact that he had sinned against God and adultery and in murder. And what he says, I'm going to read a few of the verses, starting at verse one, he says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your fa unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sin, wash me clean from my guilt and purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night against you. Listen to verse four, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight and you will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. David was like, you are right, God, and I am wrong. I got caught up, but I have no excuses. I'm asking you to have mercy on me according to your unfailing love, according to the multitude of your tender mercy. I am asking you to blot out my transgression and I acknowledge that it's against you and you alone. So so often, even as believers, we lament, but very often it's because we now have to face the consequences of our sin. And David had a lot of consequences to face, but that's not why he was crying. He was crying because he says it, it was against you. It was against you. I know that other families were affected. I know Bathsheba's family was affected by what I did. I know Uriah's family was affected. I know the kingdom was affected by what I did, but it is against you and you alone that I have sinned and done what was evil in your sight. And I want to ask you as we do a self-reflection, when God calls you on the carpet about your habits or your ways or your attitudes or your actions or something in you that is wrong, sinful, against his will, against his way, when he calls you on the carpet about it, do you do like Adam and blame somebody else? Well, it was the woman you gave me, you know, or do you say, you know what, God, you're right. You said this and I did this and it was against you and you alone that I have sinned. Even in Exodus, it made me think of Pharaoh. In Exodus, I mean, it happens. There's so many examples with the plagues back and forth, but this one was after the plague of the hail. And in, in Exodus 9, 27 to 30, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just give you those verses if you want to, if you're taking notes. It says, but then verse 27 
Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, this time I have sinned, he confessed. And so because he was tired of paying the consequences, like every time Moses said, let my people go, Pharaoh was like, no, God hardened his heart. And he said, no. And at this point, he said, this time I have sinned. He didn't say I sinned against the Lord. He wasn't truly repentant. Even verse 30 says, Moses is talking back to him. He was like, pray for me, make this go away. Make these consequences go away is what Pharaoh said, which is why he called Moses in the first place. And Moses said in verse 30, but I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord. Like I know why you calling me and I know you want me to pray and I'm going to pray for you. But I know it's not because you fear the Lord. I know it's because you're tired of these consequences. And I want to ask you, and you know, we virtual anyway, so you ain't got to turn to your neighbor or nothing like that. This is just a soul searching sermon this morning. I want to ask you when you repent, when you confess your sins, when you go to God in prayer and you are crying, is it because you are sorry that you offended the true and living God? Or are you sorry because your life now is the result, the consequence? Is be not deceived. God is not mocked. And you are asking God to have mercy on you because you don't want to have to pay the consequences of the sin that you committed. I'm not, I mean, nobody really wants negative consequences. Like, you know, they might make you cry. I'm just saying, where's your heart? Because David's heart was tender toward God. David cared what God thought. David cared that he had broken God's heart. I want to suggest to you that God has feelings. And Genesis 6, 6, as a matter of fact, let me read it. This is after you know, he had created human beings and they were just terrible. Like, you know, it was after the fall of man and this is before the flood and they were just terrible. But listen to what the New Living Translation says in Genesis 6, 6. It says, so the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And sometimes we don't think about God being heartbroken. We don't think about God having feelings, but you child of God are made in his image and his likeness. And so if you have feelings, what do you think your feelings do? From. They came from God because we have a God that has feelings and it broke his heart. The way his people, after he loved them, after he created them, after he gave them dominion over the earth, after he did everything for them, it broke his heart the way they were. Their hearts were continually bent toward evil. And so, yes, sometimes God gets angry and sometimes God gets, you know, we think of him like he's either pleased or he's angry. Like God only got two emotions, but we can behave in such a way that we can make God sad. And I know it also because in Ephesians 4.30, it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by which you have been sealed to the day of redemption. That word grieve in the Koine Greek is a deep-seated grief that one feels when a loved one dies. It is a grief you feel when you bury a loved one. And the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way you live because he's already promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So everywhere you go, he has to go. Everything you watch, he has to watch. Everything you listen to, he has to listen to because he's promised you, he's faithful. So he's promised you that he will never leave you. So what are you subjecting? him to. The God that lives down on the inside of you, what are you making him watch? What are you making him scroll through on the on your computer? What are you put? He, the Bible says, don't grieve him. You break his heart when you make him be subject to the things that that break his heart that are not holy and that are not godly. Are you perfect? No, neither am I. But I am just saying that we can grieve him, that sometimes God's not mad. Sometimes God is sad. And I'm saying David cared. He did not want God to be sad. And so he had a repentant heart. And when that man was sorry, he was sorry. We all sin. So it does. it's not like, well, this person sins and this person doesn't. Nope. We all sin. What do you do with your conviction? What do you do when God calls you on the carpet? Do you ignore it? Do you sweep it under the rug? Do you act like God's not talking to you? What do you do when God convicts you of sin? Like how many times is God going to deal with you and talk to you about your attitude? He's been dealing with your attitude for a long time. He's been dealing with your anger for a long time. He's been feeling, dealing with your spirit of rebellion for a long time. He's been dealing with your distrust for a long time. There's something down on the inside of you that you know God is dealing with you. He's dealing with you with the way you interact with your children. He's dealing with you with the way that you deal with your daughter-in-law. God's been telling you to mind your business and stay out of their marriage and it's important to God and you're ignoring it, acting like that's not really God, but that's God and you better listen to him. What do you do? Is your heart 
tender toward God or are you obstinate, you know, and your way is your way and you want to do what you want to do when you want to do it and you feel like you should be able to say what you want to say when you want to say it or is your, or is your heart repentant? When God points something out, are you godly sorry? And it's just one of the things that I know David was. And I wonder when he says, I found a man after my heart, like after my heart, when you think about, especially with young people, whether they are your kids or your grandkids or your nieces or your nephews, you know, young people, they just, they're after your heart. You know, your heart just palpitates for them. You know, you just love them and you want them to have everything and you want them to be okay. That's the visual I get when God said, David's a man, he's after my heart. That man touches my heart. David touched God's heart. And I believe that the fact that he had, he was repentant is one of the reasons. Another thing about David is David was a worshiper, but it's more than him being a worshiper. Yes, David was a worshiper, but David was demonstrative in his worship. And I think what put him over the top is David didn't care what other people thought. Like his love for God and his demonstrative worship toward God, you know, drew attention to himself, but he didn't care what people think. And I know sometimes we say we don't care what people think, but how many times have we cared what other people thought more than we cared what God thought? But David didn't care how he looked when he worshiped God. He didn't care how he looked. He didn't care who was watching. He did not care. He just gave God his all. The, the text or the scripture, the, the narrative that comes to my mind is when they brought the Ark of the Covenant um, in, back into Jerusalem. They, they, went to, they, they went to get it, they did it wrong, and it ended up in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. But once he finally realized what he had done wrong and he went back and got the Ark of the Covenant, he was so happy. And let me, let me read a couple of, of verses in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 14 says, wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Like, I mean, I wish, I wish we had videos back then. I would have loved to see that video. David was the king. Like he was the king. And if you think about it, it probably did not appear proper. It definitely was not dignified. You know what I mean? David was the king and he was dancing before the Lord. The Bible says with everything in him. You want to talk about cardio? He was dancing before the Lord with all of his might while he and all Israel were bringing the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of tr the trumpets. So he was dancing in front of all of Israel and he didn't care because he was praising the Lord and he was worshiping the Lord and the dance wasn't for them anyway. Some people will be blessed by your dance and some people will feel like it don't take all that. And the truth is you shouldn't care about what either one of them has to say because the dance is not for them. The dance is for the Lord. He was filled with gratitude. He was filled. He, he couldn't believe that God had chosen him and he was just so grateful. You know, demonstrative worship. We, we know that worship is so important to God because it's throughout scripture. Praise the Lord in the dance. Play, um, praise the Lord with musical instruments. We should praise the Lord with our physical bodies, clapping, bowing down, lifting holy hands, all of it. And I know how important it is to God because when God gives the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, you know, he says, thou shalt have no other God before me. But next he says that you must not make for yourself any idol of any kind or any image or anything in the heaven and earth. And then listen to verse five, Exodus 25, 20, verse five. He says, you must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. He says, when you bow down, when you worship, when you use your physical body to worship another God, I feel like you are showing affection. So what that ha that means is, you know, if you are in a relationship, if you have a, a spouse, you know how to be affectionate to your spouse. And I'm telling you that worship is affection to God. If you want to be affectionate to God, then worship him. And he's in, and worship him. You lift up your hands, you clap your hands you bow down before him. You engage your physical body in your worship. Yes, we ought to worship him with the 
the fruit of our lips, praise him with the words that come out of our mouth. But I want to suggest to you that we praise him in a demonstrative way as well. And David did. And he praised, he danced before the Lord with all his might. Now, I'm not trying to change your personality. When you were in the world, if you were a wallflower in the club, then you probably will be a wallflower in the kingdom. But if you were the one on the dance floor getting the party started, okay, if that was you, then it's still you. God says, don't, how are you going to give the devil less, uh, uh, more than you give me? If you like to dance, then dance before the Lord. Don't, don't ever feel like you would give, God doesn't want to feel like he knows how he made you. He knows your personality, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. He knows everything about you. And he's just saying that same energy when you were in the world. He said, I just want the same energy. I just want you to give me your all, whatever your all is. I'm not trying to change you. I'm not trying to change your personality. If you were never a dance in public with all your might kind of person, then, then you're not a dance with all your might kind of person. But if you were, let's get this party started kind of person, then God says, I want the same thing because I created you. Who do you think created dance? Who do you think created music? Who do you think created song? God says, I did all of that for me and what the devil did is he twisted it and turned it and you know made it worldly and sinful in some ways but there's nothing wrong with dancing he said I created you to dance I created music all of that I created so that you could worship me and David did and he didn't care to the point let me jump down in verse 16 as the ark of the Lord I'm still in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 16 says, the ark, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, was watching from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Now you got to read the rest of the text, but he's singing, he's dancing, he's passing out gifts to all the people. Like this is a great time of celebration. God has been so good to us. And then he comes home into his house. This is his wife to be a blessing to his wife. The Bible says verse 20, when David returned home to bless his household, then Michael, the daughter of Saul came out to meet him. And she said how the King of Israel distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would because she felt like he was not acting like the dignified king that she felt like he should be. He had danced out of his outer garments and so she called him half naked and she was just offended saying like you dance all like this in front of these servant girls and he like okay let me read I'm not gonna say what he was like I'm gonna read the bible so this is what <laughs> he's saying. she felt like um like you're not even fully dressed. Like what will people think? Like what will people think? You're acting like you're some vulgar commoner, which is what she said. In verse 21, David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. Like I was dancing before the Lord. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone in his house when he appointed me ruler over all the Lord's people. I will celebrate before the Lord. They might have been watching, but I wasn't dancing for them. You might have been watching, but I wasn't dancing for you. I was dancing before the Lord and he checked her hard who chose me over your father. And I'm going to continue to celebrate and dance before the Lord because I don't care what people think more than I care what God thinks. God knows that I was offering him up a dance. I was offering it to God. And I want to say that too, while I'm on this point before I move on. Sometimes you are in worship. One day we're going to be post-COVID and, you know, singing and dancing and clapping and you see someone, you know, I don't know if you ever seen someone and their praise just blesses you. They just, they are always demonstrative. They are always praising the Lord and you might want to do that. Well, if you want to give God a dance, then you give God a dance. It's not something that you have to wait for. If you got a spirit that you can't control, it's not the Holy Spirit. Like God doesn't make you dance. You offer God a dance. You give it to the Lord and you just, you just do whatever it is, even if it's just tapping your feet or whatever the case may be, whatever you feel led to do. And you just, sometimes God's been so good. 
that, mm -hmm. you know, we need to do something physically with our bodies, our hands, you know, our feet. And you just, you give God a dance and you can start off small, start off swaying back and forth, you know, in the pew or whatever the case may be, start off in private. Maybe you're not ready to dance before all of Israel like David did, but in your private time, in your devotional time, you can dance before the Lord and it's just you and him because it's for him anyway, you know, because you want to, and it is I know that it's easier said than done to block people out because you may not be dancing before them or for them, but you know they're watching or you know people are looking, you know, and then in this age of technology, you're like, I hope they're not recording it. But so start off small, start off when you're just home and it's just you and the Lord. And the more comfortable you get with offering God your dance or your demonstrative worship, then it will bleed into public worship. I promise you that it will. But that's one of the things that I believe that God loved about David. And let me tell you, David loved God, you know, and I was praying like, Lord, how do I even explain this point? Because we all would say we love God, right? We're saved. I love God. I love God. You love God. And so what does that mean when I say his heart was tender toward God and David loved God? I mean, he loved God like he was in love with God. He thought about God. It was not just what can God do for me? It wasn't like God, he saw God as some genie in a bottle and I'm gonna rub up on him and get my three wishes. He loved God and he thought about God. And the best illustration of that is in 2 Samuel chapter seven, when it's, he literally was just think, sitting around thinking about God. Let me read how the chapter opens up. In 2 Samuel chapter seven, it says, when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet and he said, look, David said, I'm living in this beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. And Nathan replied to the king, go ahead and do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. And so here David is already king. God has already given his, him rest from his enemies. Like he's chilling in this beautiful cedar palace and he looks out the window and he sees the ark of God, which represents the very presence of God living in a tent. And in his heart, he feel like, I can't live in a, I can't live in a palace that's nicer than God's. You know, I know God is the creator of heaven and earth, but his ark represents his presence. And I want him to have at least what I have. And so he called the prophet and was like, I want to do something. Like, I want to build a house for God to live in. I don't want him to live in a tent anymore. And we know it because, you know, Nathan was like, whatever's in your heart, God's with you. You can do whatever. But that night, God came to Nathan, and this is what he said to Nathan. He said, um, and then he told him to go tell David. He said, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites, Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent or a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet, no matter where I have gone with the people of the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? So God's saying, I've never lived in a house. No one ever thought to build me a house. If I told them to, they would have, but I didn't want to tell them to. I wanted someone to think about it. And, and David thought about it. And that's when, this is the text, when God, it blessed God so much. It moved God's heart so much. He told David, you want to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. I will, I will match your love with my love. I will match your capacity with my capacity. You want to build me a beautiful cedar palace. I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty of kings, and your kingdom will never end. And God was talking about Jesus and David was just like, whoa, you know? And so, but he loved, David loved God. Another illustration that I think of with Abraham in Genesis chapter 20, and you can read that when you get a chance, but I mean, Genesis chapter 22, um, God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much and offer him as a sacrifice. And so, you know, the whole progression of the text, we get to the point where he does it, right? And so in, in verse 15 or 16 or so, he's ready to kill Isaac and God calls to him, Abraham, Abraham, don't touch him. But what God says to him is, now I know 
you were going to give me your son, your only son. Like you trusted me enough to do what I said do, even when it didn't make any sense to you. And he says, in blessings, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply you. He, what God is saying is, I already love you to capacity. This test was to see if you love me to your capacity. I know that my capacity can't match God's capacity because God is God, but I do have a capacity and God wants to know, do you love him to your full capacity? Do you love him as much as you know how to love him? Do you love him with everything you have? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Do you, because you have a capacity. He says, I'm not asking for more than you can give. I'm asking for everything you can give. He said, because I so love you that I gave you everything I had. I gave you my only begotten son. And he said to Abraham, I wanted to know if you would give me your only begotten son. I wanted to know if your if you loved me to capacity. And here, David, that's what I'm saying. David loved God to capacity. And I want to know when you search your heart, child of God, do you love God with all your heart or do you just know that you need him? Like, you know, he's good and you know, he's God and you know, you need him. But when you don't want nothing from God, once God has given you rest from all your enemies, David was in a palace. He was safe. He was secure. He was promoted. He had money. He had prestige. He had all of that. And he still was sitting up in his palace. And what was he thinking about? He was thinking, how can I bless God? How can I show God how grateful I am for what he has done for me? And that man was a man after God's own heart. And I just got a couple more things that I'm going to run through a little bit faster, but I think it's important to point out. David had a strong moral compass. And, and I know that may seem counterintuitive because he messed up so much, but he still had a strong moral compass. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when Nathan came and gave him, you know, he didn't come at him directly. He came at him with this illustration about the lambs. David was furious. He said, whoever did that deserves to die. He needs to repay that man four lambs for the one that he took, you know, and he was outraged and didn't even know Nathan was talking about him because, but David had a strong moral compass. It doesn't mean he was perfect. It doesn't mean that he um, didn't mess up sometimes because clearly he did. But when God was able to take David out of the situation and say, David, let me show you this situation and you tell me what I should do if it wasn't you. David was like, oh, that person deserves to die for what they did, talking about himself. And God was like, mm-hmm. But he did. He had a strong moral compass, which is important to God. It's important that when we see right, we know right. And when we see wrong, we know wrong. And we're not a respecter of person. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what your social economic background is. It doesn't matter if you're male or female or rich or poor or white or black, right is right and wrong is wrong. And it's important to God that we see that we see it the way he would see it. Are we talking about right and righteousness? Because it's important. And David had a strong moral compass. And then lastly, David was humble. Oh Lord, we all need to grow. And, and I'm telling you, I want to give a full disclosure. I would not pray that God, don't pray and ask God to humble you. No, no, no. You can if you want. I have never prayed that. What my prayer is, Lord, teach me how to humble myself. I don't, because God, you ain't been humbled till God humbles you. Lord, teach me to humble myself so that I'm never in a position where you got to bring me down low. And David was humble. He knew, he knew that he didn't deserve. He knew him. Like, you know you, he knew him. And he knew that he did not deserve how good God had been to him. Back to 2 Samuel chapter seven. Now keep in mind, he had not committed adultery yet. He had not murdered yet. He hadn't even messed up, but he knew himself. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when God said, I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty of kings, when God told him your kingdom will never end, one of the things he said in response to that in 2 Samuel 7, 18, after Nathan had given him the word, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and prayed, who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And now, sovereign Lord, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving your servant a lasting dynasty? Do you deal with everyone this way, O sovereign Lord? 
What more can I say? You know what your servant is really like, sovereign Lord. He says, listen, I, I don't know what to say. Like, are you this good to everybody? Are you this kind to everybody? You've already been so good to me. And then on top of everything else, you talking about giving me a lasting dynasty? He was like, I don't know what to say because you already know what I'm really like. Like, you know, I love you with all my heart, but you already know me. You, you know what I'm like, you know my shortcomings, you know my proclivities, you know, you know my temptations, you know me. Why would you be so good to me? And that spirit of humility, God can always work with. The problem is when we get self-righteous and we start feeling like we deserve to be blessed because we read our Bible every day and we pray every day. And I be trying to tell them because we serve the Lord and we show up and we, you know, open the church and close the church. And, you know, we're faithful and dependable, which we should be, but we all have sinned and come short of God's glory. Like he wants us to understand that you don't deserve how good I am to you. You don't deserve to be blessed. I don't bless you because you deserve it. I bless you because I'm good. I bless you because I'm God. I bless you because you're mine. You, you serve me because you love me. And I bless you because I love you. But this is not a point system. This is not stars on the refrigerator. You're not earning my blessing. And David understood that there was nothing he would ever be able to do in order to deserve how good God has been to us. And when we get to a place in our walk with God where we understand that there is nothing that we ever would be able to do. I want you to get to the point where you pray every day. I want you to get to the point where you read your Bible every day. But here's what we have to understand. If I do, if I get to the point where I am faithful in my walk with God and I don't keep falling and I don't keep falling in sin no more, now unto him who's able, to keep you from falling. Who you think is keeping you from falling? If you're not in sin, who you think is keeping you? God is keeping you. You can't keep yourself. You, if you're being kept, it's because you're being kept. If you're not, if you're not doing what you used to do, it's because God changed you. It's because He changed your mind. If you don't like what you used to like, it's because God delivered you. Like none of it's you. None of it's me. You know, on my best days is because God has been done a work in me. My own righteousness is filthy rags. And if I do anything good, then to God be the glory. It is his treasure that he's put in a clay jar on your best day. You are just a clay jar. And it is the excellency of the power is of him and not of us not of me, not of you. If you have a good idea, God gave it to you. If you have a kind word for someone, God gave it to you. You know, if you, if you have the right response for someone, God gave it to you. If you do a random act of kindness, God led you to do it. All of it is God. And so David's humility put him in a place where God was able to bless him. And so when, you know, it is my prayer that I be a woman after God's own heart. And it's my prayer that you be men and women after God's own heart. And I believe that we can learn from David. And, and the way David was, was doable. I don't have to be perfect. I just have to love God. I just have to have a heart that is tender toward him. And I want to ask you today, is your heart tender toward God? Amen. God bless you. That is the word that the Lord gave um, for, from, for me to me for you this morning. And I want to give you, I don't want to take for granted that we are all saved. And I want to give you an opportunity to be saved. I mentioned it in the very beginning that the Bible says that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. It is with the heart that man believeth unto righteousness. And it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. And so if you Never remember a time in your life where you asked Jesus to come into your heart and to save you. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And so I am just going to pray this prayer because it's more than just us in this Zoom. It is those that are watching on Facebook. It is those that will be watching at some other time. We're going to let God be God and do his full scope. So I'm going to pray. And if you are watching, whether it is in real time or you're watching long after this thing has been posted and you know that God is talking to you and you want to be saved and you don't know if you were to die today where you would spend eternity, 
then repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to pray and just say the same words that I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross for my sins. I accept that I am a sinner and I need a savior. Please come into my heart and save me. Make me brand new. Make me like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved once, saved, always saved. If you are a member of a church, great. If you are not, I encourage you to reach out to Pastors Cooper, the um, Bible Baptist Church where the word of God is preached and taught and lived. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.